Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Mean Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Mean Street podcast interview. Today's special guest, I'm really excited to speak to. I started learning about his work back in, I think, 2005 or six, watching those videos predicting the housing boom, uh, excuse me, predicting the housing bust. And then he was <laughs> arguing with all the, the housing bulls. Uh, there's not going to be housing crash. There's not going to be housing crash. Those videos have millions and millions of views. On YouTube, he is the chief economist and global strategist at Euro Pacific Capital, three time best selling New York Times author, founder of Shift Gold, and host of Shift Radio. Peter Schiff, thank you for joining me. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me on your podcast. So, we're recording this interview, Peter, on Wednesday, September 27th, 2023. Lots of craziness going on because the Fed has raised interest rates at a rapid pace. But I would argue that they already set the bust. The bust was already in motion before the interest rate hikes, because I believe in the Austrian School of Economics. I believe in the Austrian theory of the business cycle. You were predicting the housing bubble bursting in 2005, six, and everyone was calling you names wrong. You were proven correct. What do you think is going to happen this time with a credit bust and a real estate bust? Do you think we're headed for a commercial real estate bust, or do you think the problems are going to be even larger than that? Well, I mean, first of all, I don't even think Austrian uh, business cycle theory is a theory. I think it's proven. I think it's a fact. It's just that, you know, too many people don't accept that and they believe in a bunch of nonsense. It's kind of like, you know, I, I, I think, uh, Austrian economics is like astronomy and everybody else believes in astrology. You know, there's no scientific basis for, uh, their beliefs. So, you know, what's happening now in, uh, in the markets is very, very eerily reminiscent of what was going on, you know, back in the the dot com era, or, or or more the housing the housing bubble, because you know not only did I warn about this for years, based on the malinvestments that I saw firsthand, you know, building up in the economy due to the Greenspan Fed and the one percent interest rates, but I I, I really was writing about and warning about the problems in the mortgage market, the subprime market, um, and the trouble that the banks were getting into, and what was going to happen to the financial sector when interest rates inevitably rose and housing prices inevitably uh, fell, right? And nobody cared about it. Everybody was oblivious to something that I thought was so obvious until, you know, Lehman Brothers failed, you know, until, you know, Fannie and Freddie went bankrupt, Uh, Bear Stearns failed, Uh, AIG, all these things had to blow up. And then the markets uh, became concerned. But even then, they still didn't understand the cause of the problem. And and they still thought that the Federal Reserve was the solution uh, rather than the problem itself. But what's happening now is, is, to me, the crisis that is around the corner is so much worse or is going to be so much worse so you were talking about all the entities that failed fannie freddie lehman that's when people started to wake up but then they wanted the fed to provide the solution when the fed had been the bartender handing out the drinks to the drunk right but the 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 point the point i'm making now is that the the crisis back then the the bus that was going to follow that boom um, was inevitable and 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 easy to understand. Yet so many people were completely caught off guard, and then they said, "Well, nobody could have predicted it. It was like a hundred year flood." Well, the malinvestments that have been created since two thousand and eight, because now we've had interest rates not at one percent but at zero percent, and not just for a couple of years, but for over a decade. And we've had all this um, money printing, all this inflation, you know, QE. We have built an entire economy on a foundation of you know, cheap money. And we've had, a, a, you know, long term interest rates, you know, at ridiculously low levels. And, you know, when when um, people were refinancing their mortgages in the threes and some people even got in, in the twos. But when everybody was talking about how great this was for the country, because everybody was locking in these low mortgages, I was the only person saying, wait a minute, this is going to be a disaster for the banks and anybody who owns these mortgages once interest rates eventually go up. 
it's a great deal for the borrower. It's going to bankrupt the lender. They're stuck with this paper. And um, and here we are. You know, mortgage rates are now 8%. And banks are holding on to 30-year mortgages with a three-handle or a four-handle. And they're upside down. Also, the Fed funds rate is up above 5 5 5.5%. But the banks can't pay their depositors because they've locked all their money up in these low yielding long term obligations and so their their customers are pulling their money out of the banks and they're buying money markets you know the entire banking system is insolvent it is more insolvent now than it was in 2008 meanwhile you've got the perfect storm because look what's happened to commercial real estate a problem that we didn't have in 2008 you have 10 years of mispricing commercial real estate where interest rates were artificially low, and so commercial real estate prices were artificially high. Well, now that you've had this crash in the bond market, commercial real estate trades like a bond. And so you now have commercial real estate prices that are literally half of what they were a few years ago. Meanwhile, the occupancy rates have collapsed. So landlords not only are seeing you know, the cap rates you know, implode on their property, but their rental income is gone because Companies don't need all this space anymore. Their employees are working from home. Uh, or if it's a retailer, their customers are shopping from home and buying online. So you have this glut of office space. You've got this glut of uh, retail space. And the owners are just going to walk away. You know, jingle mail, just like the people walked away from their underwater mortgages. Uh, now you have the commercial landlords that are walking away from their properties now, you're not going to see a lot of uh, homeowners walk away this time because they got such great deals on their mortgages. They're not going anywhere. They're going to stay there. Uh, but that's not helping the banks because the banks actually want those properties sold because then they can get out from under these mortgages because the new buyer would have to borrow at 8%. The problem is the new buyer can't afford 8%, but the existing owners are stuck in those houses. But the banks are losing a fortune on these houses, even if nobody defaults. <laughs> That's the problem. They're, these are money losing mortgages. Uh, so the, the residential is a disaster. Commercial is a disaster. And, and meanwhile, you know, we're resetting interest rates, you know, for fun on my podcast yesterday. I don't know. You, you go to the website, um, uh, the national debt clock dot org. You ever go to that site? Yep. We're rising at our, it, it's exponential now. It's adding a trillion dollars in a year or less now. It's uh, insane. Well, we added the last trillion in one quarter. It took three months to add the last trillion to go from 32 to 33, 33. But they have a button on that site where it, it'll extrapolate into the future. And so you can check the deficit in 2027. And when you do that, it shows the national debt of about 45 trillion. And it shows interest on the national debt of just under three trillion a year, triple what we're spending on national defense and more than we spend on either Medicare or Social Security. I mean, it's it's unfathomable. I mean, you're it's about 75 percent of tax revenue it is is earmarked for interest on the debt. And if you can go forward another year, which they don't have, it's probably 100 percent. I mean, obviously, you can't have a government where all of the tax revenue just goes to pay interest on the debt. And there's nothing there for anything else unless you borrow that too. So this is a major fiscal train wreck of unprecedented proportions that we are on the cusp of. The other part of this puzzle I see, Peter, is that the retail investor is buying treasuries for the yield, but foreigners, so China, Japan, Germany, the normal buyers, large buyers in size of U.S. treasuries with their trade surpluses the last couple of decades, they are not buyers of U.S. treasuries. The other part of the puzzle I see, and you mentioned the loan books for the regional banks, the insurance companies are also sitting on enormous losses on commercial real estate. And they're also sitting on enormous losses on U.S. Treasury bonds. And then you add in that there's not as much foreign demand for U.S. Treasuries and the U.S. Treasury needs to sell even more Treasuries going forward. And they have to roll over, what, 7.6 trillion approximately of debt in the next 12 months. So it, the math just doesn't work. Oh, yeah. I mean, th this is the point. You know, if, you know, Janet Yellen was asked not too long ago, you know, 
about the debt. And she said, it's not a problem because I don't care about the, the, the notional value. She said, what we care about is the interest rates, the payments. Can we handle the payments? And she said, interest rates are very low, so the debt isn't a problem. And at the time I said, well, you know, yeah, that was the same thing with the teaser rate on the mortgage. Well, yeah, when the rate is low, it's not a problem. But what happens when it goes up? Then it's a big problem. Well, the rates have gone up a lot and it's already a big problem and rates aren't even finished going up. I mean, they're still lower than normal. You know, we're in the process of normalizing, but we haven't completed the process. But this economy isn't built for normal interest rates. It can't withstand normal interest rates because we have an abnormal amount of debt. But because we have so much debt and the prospects for monetizing that debt are so large, the, the prospects for future inflation are that much greater. So we should have an even steeper yield curve than the historic norm. So if you have a five and a half percent, you know, six month T-bill, uh, I'd say a 30 year should probably be eight or nine percent, you know, not, you know, six or seven. And we're not even at five yet. We're at like four point seven. But the economy is not built to withstand this because we have too much debt. And it's not just the federal government. It's all the state governments that have borrowed a ton of money. You know, what, what everybody was saying over the past 10, 12 years was now's the time to borrow. Interest rates are really cheap. Take advantage of it. And so everybody borrowed. All these politicians promised all kinds of freebies to the voters and borrowed the money to pay for it because the, the interest rates were low. And I was saying all this time that they were talking about, we need to borrow because it's cheap. My analogy was, well, just because something is cheap, right? I said, if heroin is free, does that mean you do it just because it's free? Oh, God, look at all this free heroin. I can't waste that. You know, you, you, I always said that this was going to come back to bite them when interest rates eventually rose because they could not stay down there forever because I knew eventually inflation would rear its ugly head because the only way they were able to make those interest rates possible was to create inflation. What, what surprised a lot of people, including me, was the lag. How much time took place between the creation of the inflation, the monetization of all that debt, and the impact on consumer prices. Now, one of the reasons we didn't see it is because the government lied about it, right? Because CPI is, does not honestly reflect the increase in prices. But now the prices are rising so much that even the government's bullshit numbers can't hide it. Right? It's, it's, it's so bad now. And you know that's why you have all these jobs. I mean, record numbers of Americans are working two or three jobs because they can't make it on one job because prices have gone up so much and their wages have not. But I mean, this is a massive collapse that, that we're uh, headed for. Uh, there's no way to stop it. Um, it's going to be much worse because we've delayed it as long as we have. The, the, the problem is, of course, just like with the financial crisis, they're going to blame it on capitalism. They're going to they're going to blame everything on greed and uh, profiteering and uh, you know, Putin or OPEC, whatever they're going to do, speculators, gold hoarders, I don't know. Uh, but they're going to end up, you know, expanding dramatically the power of government. That's the most likely course. You know, they're going to take control of 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 pretty much the entire economy. You know, they'll probably use emergency powers and, and take control of the banks. Uh, they may even take control of the supermarkets. Who knows? But I mean, this this, this is scary when, when you think about how the government is going to react to the crisis they caused. Yeah, I agree. Loss of freedom, potentially central bank digital currencies, even more capital controls or restrictions. I also see, and I agree with you, more debt monetization, either on or off Fed balance sheet. I honestly don't think the Fed's balance sheet that they say publicly is true. I think it's fake. Uh, I think it's definitely phony. God, only God knows what they're doing off balance sheet with all these new liquidity programs or shadow liquidity programs they create. But I agree. They're oh, gonna yeah. What, what they're doing now, all the banks, and yeah, they've got to be lying about their balance sheet because all these banks, as their depositors are yanking out their money so they can get a return on it, um, the banks then take their underwater uh, treasuries or mortgage-backed securities and they give them to the Fed at par. So they need, they need to raise money. They have to sell mortgage-backed securities. They've got a mortgage-backed security that they're carrying at par on their books that's worth 60 cents. They can't sell it or they would they would be insolvent 
and they'd be put out of business. So they take this 60 cent paper to the Fed and the Fed loans them a dollar. <laughs> so now they can take the dollar and give it to their customer, but they owe the Fed this money. They can't pay it back. Well, you the know? Fed the <laughs> Fed will just waive the loans, Peter. This is like they did this in the 2019 repo crisis. What I think the Fed was t- giving out loans at par for, for toxic garbage derivatives that were worth 10 or 20 cents on the dollar. Yeah, but when the when the markets don't realize when the, when they have to forgive these loans or basically just roll them over in perpetuity, you know, then it's you know it's more debt monetization. You know, they can't claim they're shrinking their balance sheet when their balance sheet is exploding. But people don't get that like inflation's never going back down to two percent. I mean, not I mean, never is a long time, but certainly not in the lifetime of of Jerome Powell. Or <laughs> so. Um, uh, inflation is above 2% for the duration, way above 2%. And there's no way to bring the rate back down that's politically acceptable. And so in order to prevent massive cuts to Social Security and Medicare, you know, official cuts, and maybe a default on the national debt, in order to prevent the banks from failing, uh, they're just going to pick what they believe is the lesser of the evils, and that is massive inflation. And And so what we're seeing now in inflation is the tip of the iceberg. That is their the only get out of jail free card that they think they have up their sleeve is inflate. And and then we can blame the inflation on on somebody, but that's the only way out of this because if we if we try to get rid of inflation, then we collapse the entire economy that we built on the foundation of inflation. Right? That's that's the secret. That's how we've been able to survive. We create inflation every time there's been a problem. The Fed's solution has been more inflation. Well, the the Fed papers it over. So the P- Fed papers it over bailouts, uh, shadow liquidity programs. Uh, they don't count a lot of the stuff on the balance sheet, the bailouts. This crisis, though, Peter, I think is different because I think the larger problems, like you said, are commercial real estate. But also, I think, and a lot of people aren't talking about this yet, are the losses on older treasury bonds. We're going to see just massive losses on treasury bonds that the large banks, the regional banks, and now the insurance companies, because the insurance companies have massive amounts of commercial real estate and also older treasury bonds. We're going to see just massive losses in. Yeah. And of course, the insurance companies, they just can't carry them indefinitely because they have claims. They have to pay. They have they have to sell these. And of course, also pension funds. Pension funds are having huge losses because, you know, a lot of these pension funds, you know, they, they bought bonds as, you know, a safe diversifier of their portfolios. I mean, bonds have been slaughtered. Bonds are down more than stocks this year. I mean, I don't even think stocks are down yet, but bonds are decimated. They're probably down maybe 12% on top of the 30% they were down last year. Uh, But anybody that owns bonds is getting killed. If they have to sell the bonds, right, then they have to realize those losses instead of just, you know, having them as a, a on paper. But insurance companies, pension companies, um, and now, of course, the government guarantees all these pensions. Um, you know, everything is guaranteed. So all the losses end up on the taxpayer, but the taxpayer doesn't have any money. The government doesn't have any money. We're running over a two trillion dollar deficit. So all of this has to get monetized. All these government commitments to the extent that they're going to be met. It's all inflation that's going to pay for. it. So I know there's a lot of deflationists out there. I just don't see the government allowing deflation for a long period of time. That means the tax revenues collapse. Really, Peter, since 2008, when the tax revenues have collapsed, that's the main reason for quantitative easing and the Fed expanding its balance sheet. You see the government tax receipts collapse and government doesn't want to cut spending. So yeah, there's bailouts of banks. Yeah, there's bailouts of corporations. Main Street's not really getting that much. It's the government that's getting the bail. So the government doesn't have to cut back on spending. That's why we had QE and Fed balance sheet expansion in 2008 and in 2020. The, the government cannot allow a deflation, even though that is what the economy needs, and that's what would benefit uh, you know, consumers. The government is the world's biggest debtor, and deflation destroys debtors because it, it increases the real value of their obligations. And if there's a real deflationary collapse and the government's revenues go down, uh, how is it going to service this debt? How is it going to repay this debt? Plus, you know, the Social Security benefits, just because there's deflation, they can't cut the Social Security benefits or the Medicare benefits. And even if there is deflation, 
It isn't going to be in healthcare. It's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be. Uh, so the prices are going to keep going up there. So the government's finances are even worse during deflation. And of course, if there's a big deflation, you know, a lot of banks are going to fail. Pension funds are going to fail. Again, the government's going to be there to have to bail all these companies out and they don't have the money. So it's obvious that these forces will result in massive inflation because the only way to stop the deflation is by creating massive inflation. And, and so when people want to talk about deflation from a perspective of falling prices rather than a contraction in the money supply or supply credit, where you're going to ultimately see this great deflation is in terms of gold. So if you if you think of gold as money, and if you think of prices in terms of gold, prices are going to crash in terms of gold. There's your deflation. Right? But in terms of fiat currency, in terms of a Federal Reserve note, you know, aka a dollar, no, prices are going to go up because the value of those dollars is going to go down more <laughs> than the you know the value of the goods and services. So that means prices are going to go up in dollars even as they go down in real terms when you price stuff in real money. And really since the Alan Greenspan Fed and interest rates started going down after Paul Volcker, we've seen Fed policy and they were openly promoting this, writing papers on it, op-eds in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal for years, uh, interviews on TV talking about the wealth effect. Anyone who studies Austrian school economics knows about the Cantillon effect. It seems that the policy for decades, Peter, has been to in intentionally inflate here in the United States asset prices. So stocks, bonds, real estate intentionally for decades. And then every time these asset prices fall, the, the government ste steps back in with some type of quantitative easing or some type of liquidity program to try to move the asset prices up. Uh, that coincides, I guess, with the tax revenues collapsing. But now here we are. We have the worst wealth disparity here in the United States since the 1920s. So my generation, which is younger, we're not able to go buy a home because we don't have the proof of income or can't make the 20 percent down payment on our own. And we don't have the stock portfolio of your generation. Yeah, well, you know, it's, not, it's probably just as well that people can't buy homes now because they'd be overpaying. I mean, ultimately, what has to give is price. See, right now you've got this standstill in the market. There's not a lot of supply because nobody can afford to sell because they'd lose their mortgage. So people are going to hold on to these homes so they can stay in these mortgages because rents have gone up a lot. So if you own a home and you and you got a 3% mortgage, that mortgage is a valuable asset that is tied to your home and you don't want to give it up. So you're going to stay in your home. Um, so that means there's not a lot of supply. Meanwhile, the construction and labor costs have gone up a lot, so they can't build a lot of new homes. So if you do want to buy a home, you've got to pay up for it. But eventually, a lot of the homes are going to come on the market. Because even if you have a fixed rate mortgage in the threes, at some point, you can't even afford to make those payments. Uh, the cost of living goes up enough. You lose your job. Uh, and, and, and those houses are eventually going to come on the market. Uh, and then the price has to crash because that's the only way that somebody can afford to buy. Because you can't afford the price with an 8% mortgage. And that's now. By next year, I would expect mortgage rates to be in the double digits. I mean, 10% plus. And, you know, we had that once before in the 80s and 70s. Um, but prices were a lot lower back then. And people had a lot more savings at the time. Um, you know, they don't have it today. And also what a lot of people are not talking about, too, besides the inflated home prices and the mortgage is going up, like you said, you also have these governments and they're greedy. They don't want to cut back. They're raising property taxes. So in a lot of cities and states and counties, they're raising property taxes enormously. I'm seeing people posting like their property tax bills are up a lot in the last couple of years. So people all of a sudden are just getting enormous property tax increases. That's going to also incentivize people to sell. Yeah, I mean, property taxes are going up, but also... Um insurance i mean i saw my own insurance costs on a home i had in connecticut basically doubled my insurance my annual my bills not because i ever put in a claim i didn't but it was just the value of replacing my house if something happened was so much higher even though i couldn't even sell it for the price 
they knew if my house burnt down, you know, it would cost a lot more to rebuild it with the materials and, and, and the labor and everything. So maintenance costs are going up. I mean, everything that goes wrong, it costs a lot more. Your utility bills. Uh, so everything associated with home ownership has gotten a lot more expensive. And that's going to happen. I mean, look at oil prices. Oil is almost $94 a barrel. Um, you know, in the in the last four months, we're, we're almost up 50 percent, I think, in the price of oil. Um, and, but it's not going to stop because now they, they can't sell any more oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. I mean, it's already at record lows. Um, so they really can't deplete it anymore. That was what really brought the oil price down. And that's what brought the CPI down. And so that's what it allowed the Fed to pretend that it was making some headway on inflation. But it hasn't. And now, you know, we we're already looking at the CPI lows in the rearview mirror and it's uphill from here. And so we never made it back down to two percent. And now we're headed back up to double digits. You know, we're in the wrong direction. And the Fed's already got rates at, at five and, and a half. And they're only talking about one more rate hike. What's that going to do? Nothing. If 500 basis points didn't stop inflation, what's another 25 going to do? Well, so I think it'll know. accelerate a bust. It'll accelerate a credit bust. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, the other irony of it is that people don't understand this, that these rate hikes are actually contributing to higher uh, uh, increases in the CPI because interest rates are a cost. Ironically, one of the reasons that inflation was low is because businesses were able to pass on their cheap financing costs to their customers. Customers got a break because of how low interest rates were. And so that distorted the whole picture, right? And the Fed looks at that and says, oh, there's very little inflation. Well, yeah, because you've got interest rates at zero and that 0% interest rates is, you know, is, is being reflected uh, in, in, in low prices. But now that all these companies that were getting their capital for free have to pay six, seven, eight percent to get that capital, that's just like, labor costs. That's just like rents. They got to pass that on. And so we're just seeing now these higher interest rates being filtered through into the CPI. They're going to show up in the price of everything because everybody's got so much debt. So or it's like they, or they they'll change the formula. <laughs> they'll change the formula again. They'll have, they'll have to issue a, put a new press release. Oh, we're changing the formula again for the CPI. So the cost of living adjustments don't go up anymore. <laughs> Yeah, well, they won't put out a press release. They'll just do it, you know. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, but the inflation's not going to stop. You know, that's why you know there. You know, this time next year, we could be in full blown price controls because the, I don't know what else they're going to do because they're not going to do what it takes, which is slash government spending. I mean, that is just one of the most ridiculous part about what's going on is you got Powell up there talking about how he's you know he wants to be restrictive, but what about the government, which is being stimulative. We're running the biggest non-inflation, non-recessionary deficits in history. And if you're a Keynesian, and you know, which they all are, how could you ignore this massive fiscal stimulus when they're supposedly trying to fight inflation? <laughs> when the fiscal stimulus is going to drive inflation higher. You know, it, the only way that you can reduce inflation by raising interest rates is by reducing consumption. You've got to stop people from spending and encourage savings. But if you look at the numbers, the savings rate has collapsed the whole time the Fed's been hiking rates and consumer credit has gone through the roof. And so is government debt. So despite all these rate hikes, people are borrowing even more than they were before the hikes and they're saving even less. But so infl inflation is driving it, so they're not getting wealthier. So it, they're they're spending more for inflation. Their standard of living is actually collapsing. Their costs are going up. They're not benefiting. Um, the economy oh, yeah. is not benefiting. Yeah, they're not buying more. They're just paying more. But the only way to fight inflation is for consumers to save their money instead of spending it. That's what they have to do. They have to earn money and not spend it. But that's not what's happening. People well, are spending even more than they earn. The credit card debt is exploding. So, you know, th this is inflationary. Credit is expanding. That's part of the inflationary problem. We need to contract consumer uh, credit. And what has to happen is businesses have to tap into that growing savings pool 
to make capital investments so that we can expand output because that that would also bring downward pressure on prices. But the economy is collapsing. Look at all the industrial production numbers and all all the manufacturing numbers. They're all in recession. Manufacturing is contracting. Yeah, stagflation. Yeah, so all the we're seeing it, and you, I know you run a business. I run a small business. We're seeing input costs. So you mentioned insurance costs. I mean, the consumer price index isn't going to reflect this accurately. The consumer price index isn't measuring healthcare costs accurately. With they're measuring Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement costs for rent. They they created this fictional uh, thing called owner's equivalent rent, which doesn't reflect reality. Mortgage co- anyone's mortgage costs or rents. Or it it uh, so much of the data doesn't reflect reality at all. Oh, no, no, nothing. Everything refl- reflects fantasy because we've been living in a fantasy land, uh, courtesy of the Fed. You know, by keeping interest rates this low, you know, everybody got rich for nothing. Uh, the government, the politicians could promise something for nothing. All these benefits, no one had to pay for it. Everything was just borrowed. You know, how fight a war, borrow that. You know, was it like World War II where we went to war and taxes doubled and tripled because the government was honest with the people and said, hey, we're going to war, so you got to pay for it. You know, the wars that we've had recently, we no one had to pay anything. It was like these wars are free. In fact, don't stop spending. Make sure you keep spending during the war. In World War II, the government told people to stop spending. There was rationing. It was more honest. It was like, hey, we need these resources to fight this war. So you can't you can't buy as much stuff as you used to buy. But during the, the war on terror or the war on COVID, we were not only encouraging people to buy, we were giving them stimulus checks to buy, <laughs> even as they weren't working. So, you know, it's the most asinine combination of monetary and fiscal policy. I mean, normally you have to go to a Zimbabwe, you know, Argentina, you know, uh, Venezuela to see this kind of uh, economic uh, policy. <laughs> but no, you now you have it in the issuer of the world's reserve currency. You have it in the United States. So. You know, that's why, I mean, this collapse is going to be so unprecedented in scale. You know, other small countries have gone through it. Yeah, the, you know, Zimbabwe went through it, but Zimbabwe was a footnote in the global economy. I mean, yeah, it was bad news for the people who live there, but outside of Zimbabwe, no one cared. But you have hyperinflation in America. It's a whole different story. Well, the main issue the Fed wasn't counting on is the large buyers of U.S. Treasury debt. So China, Germany, Japan, so the countries that run the trade surpluses are no longer net buyers. So who's going to buy the mass amount of Treasury debt that the Fed needs to sell? But I want to get your thoughts before that, though. Nobody. On the on, hmm? nobody, just the Fed. There's nobody to buy that debt. So you expect then the Fed to monetize it or the U.S. Treasury one way or another on or off balance sheet? It's going to have to. I mean, it shouldn't. But given the political realities of what will happen if they don't, they will. That's why most of my money is not, I'm not just short the market, I'm long gold. I'm long gold stocks, energy stocks, I'm long the inflation trade. I'm I'm, I'm bullish on inflation because I think when faced between those two choices, they're going to choose inflation, right? Rather than an implosion of the system, Now, ultimately, inflation is going to collapse the system anyway. It's just that that will happen later. If they really stick to their guns on fighting inflation, the other crash will happen sooner. And and that's what they don't want. They want to postpone that at any cost, even if it means uh, higher inflation. And at the end of the day, they might say, hey, what's so bad about 4 or 5% inflation? Where did we get 2% anyway? Who said that that's the holy grail? They might say, look, you know, We'll settle on four or five, but of course, four or five is really like fifteen or twenty, based on the way they, you know, the phony way they measure it. But I agree. The best case scenario is stagflation, and I don't know if they can keep things in stagflation for that long. Well, they can't because once once the world recognizes that inflation is going to be high in perpetuity, well, then the bonds crash even more. Gold explodes. I mean, and then the dollar is no longer the reserve currency. You you can't be the reserve currency if you've thrown in the towel on the inflation war. If you're telling the world our currency is going to lose a lot of value every year, how can it be a reserve for anything? So, you know, it it could. Well, why why do you think the dollar is, is rising so rapidly then against other currencies then? 
Well, it's 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 rising. It's really not that rapid compared to what you know what we had, let's say, in the 2008 financial crisis. But the dollar index is creeping higher uh, every day. Um, and again, I. I I think these are the way the trading algorithms have been programmed. They see the bond yields rising and they think, oh, buy dollars, higher interest rates. The bond yields are rising because of a loss of confidence in, in treasuries because of ex, you know, heightening inflation expectations because of these fiscal imbalances. This is bearish for the dollar. But the, you know, the, the trading algorithms don't have that programmed in. Um, you know, look at oil prices. Oil prices are surging. Gold prices in oil and normally move with oil. Instead, oil keeps going up and gold, gold keeps going down. Why? Because the traders look at higher oil prices and they say, oh, more inflation. That means the Fed's going to have to fight harder. So we're going to have to go higher for longer. And that is thought of as being bearish for gold. But again, it's all bullish for gold because higher inflation is going to weaken the economy cause larger budget deficits, which is more inflation, which is bullish for gold. I mean, there's it doesn't make any sense that the markets think higher inflation is bearish for gold. It's just because they assume that the higher inflation is going to go away. But, you know, this has been happening now for years. The market has been surprised by higher than higher inflation. But every time it's surprised, they still expect it to go away because they still think the Fed can succeed in doing the impossible. Well, Peter, the price action that we've seen in a lot of different markets lately, other than oil, and I think oil is being driven by supply and demand with the production cuts from Saudis and OPEC and some of the others and the US production that's slowing down and the SPR uh, oil ending. But the price action we've seen in other markets the last couple of weeks, it seems more like a deleveraging kind of the markets throwing a temper tantrum to the Fed, telling the Fed that there's going to be a credit bus soon, there's going to be a crash if the Fed doesn't um, lower interest rates or at least stop the interest rate hikes? Well, yeah, I mean, there's going to. I mean, there's no question that that, that that's going to happen. But again, these idiots at the Fed, I mean, and whether they're this dumb or, you know, they're just lying and it's always hard to know, you know, what it is. But they're, um, you know, most probable scenario is that there isn't even a recession, that there's this soft landing, that somehow the markets are just going to absorb all these rate hikes, and we're not even going to have a recession, which is a completely ridiculous position to have. You know, so it's almost like they must be lying because nobody could be that dumb. It reminds me of 2005, 2006, 2007, almost the exact same comments that are coming out of the Fed and Wall Street, very similar to 2005, 2006, 2007, the calm before the storm. Yeah. And look, I mean, and I remember, too, you know, being short subprime mortgages that, you know, for the first week or two, just kind of getting frustrated that the bonds that I was short weren't dropping. They were still above par. I was like, how is this possible? Now, what I should have just done is shorted more. You know, that, that was the mistake I made. I should have just taken advantage of it. But it, it was like there was such a massive, you know, hesitation or reluctance on the part of everybody to admit that everything they thought for so long was completely wrong until they finally, it finally happened. And it, something like that, you know, an emperor has no clothes moment is coming, you know, or the wily coyote where the roadrunner, you know, or the, not the coyote finally looks down and realizes he's standing on in, in thin air and he's no longer on the on the, the cliff. And, and, you know, he doesn't fall until he realizes he's not standing on anything. And um, that's what's going to happen in the markets. I mean, when the markets, when the investors look down and realize there's nothing but air beneath them. Um, it's going to be a collapse. And of course, then, right, is the Fed going to come to the rescue? And what people are not asking is what happens if there is a massive implosion, banks, big bank failures or market crash, and the Fed comes in with rate cuts and more QE, but inflation isn't anywhere near 2%. It's well above 2% and headed higher. And the actions that they take push 
the rate even higher than that because it collapses the dollar. You know, nobody is even contemplating um, these scenarios. You know, Murphy's Law, you know, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. There's so much that can go wrong, and it's probably all going to go wrong. Yet everybody assumes nothing's going to go wrong. Do you think uh, there's a scenario where if the dollar keeps rising that other countries, European Union, European banks, Japan, uh, China, because there's tens of trillions of dollar denominated debt in the euro dollar system outside the United States, that if the dollar keeps rising, those countries could have problems first and then those countries could collapse and, and then the U.S. would be safe for last? Do you see a scenario like that? Well, you know, that is the scenario that a lot of people have that, you know, we will actually be the last one to collapse because everybody is going to pile into the dollar uh, you know, as a safe haven, which, I mean, I guess that's possible. But at some point, the people that are doing that trade are going to have to question the, the final outcome <laughs> because, you know, the more money that we're able to borrow because we're the safe haven, the deeper into debt we 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 go and the bigger the problems are allowed to grow and and so it just makes the inevitable collapse that much worse you know the the bigger the boom the bigger the bust so in the end anybody who is buying dollars as a safe haven is going to end up with tremendous losses so this is a question is when when do the markets begin to re realize that and 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 price that but but yeah, as long as people perceive the dollar as a safe haven, it's a self-perpetuating a cycle. And Americans can take advantage of that by going deeper into debt. But it simply, you know, means that the inevitable collapse when the markets figure out that there's no safety in, in this so-called safe haven, uh, then it's that much worse. Well, I think the U.S. government has taken advantage of this for decades, really post-World War II, as we shipped out dollars and U.S. treasuries for other countries, hard-earned hard, uh, the manufacturing goods and raw commodities. Yeah, I mean, I've been trying to explain that to people for decades now that, you know, the, the world had a raw deal. I mean, we had a great deal, uh, tremendous seniorage gain on the currency we create. Um, it cost us nothing, really, to just create money out of thin air. And then we exchange it for real resources, uh, real consumer goods that, that 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 take real capital and labor and land to produce. And 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 so Americans were able to live well beyond their means only because the rest of the world consented to living beneath their means. Uh, but, you know, this whole system is cracking. It's falling apart. I mean, you could see the beginning of that when we had to go to zero percent interest rates. Um. And, and, and so this is the end of that period. It's just being dragged out. But it's just amazing how few people. I mean, you have conversations like this between us uh, on, you know, small uh, YouTube channels. But nobody in the mainstream, not only I mean, they don't have these conversations at all. I mean, well, they're I, they're all getting rich I, off the current system. I mean, I, I live 20 minutes out of side of Washington, D.C., and there's socialists who go on TV. They literally go on the cable news networks and they bash capitalism. But in private, all they talk about are the stock trades and getting rich. So the, the D.C. is so full of shit <laughs> and hypocrisy. And the they don't care about spend, they don't care about spending cuts. No one's talking about spending cuts here. Well, and the stock market isn't really capitalism anymore. It's just a casino. You know, and and it's being the asset prices are overvalued due to the, the Fed. So there's not that much capitalism even left in the stock market. There's a lot of greed there. <laughs> and, you know, but it, I wouldn't say there's a lot of capitalism going on. <laughs> Well, I'm just talking about the hypocrisy, though, that these are people that that bash wealthy people want to tax them. But all they talk about oh. is money and and expensive stuff. So they're they're totally full of it. Oh, they're they're pure hypocrites uh, for sure. And, you know, the worst part about it is, you know, you have a lot of people that that don't trust businessmen because they think they're greedy, yet they have complete faith in politicians who are even greedier. And they go into politics to help themselves. The idea that they're there to serve the public is a bunch of BS. That's just their spiel, you know, uh, their, for their stump speeches. But the, the, the reality of it is, though, there's greedy people, you know, in all walks of life. You don't have to fear a greedy businessman because a greedy businessman who's smart 
uh, is just going to, you know, try their best to satisfy you. So they keep your business. They have to earn your money. They can't take your money under capitalism. They have to earn it. So they got to give you a good deal that you voluntarily agree to. That's a better deal than some other businessman is offering you. So greed is good in that sense, you know, like from Wall Street. But politicians, greed is very dangerous because the politicians don't have to earn your money. They can take your money. You have no say in the matter. They don't have to treat you fairly. They don't have to give you a good deal. Right. And, and so greed is a lot more dangerous to individual liberty and your, your prosperity when it's in government than when it's in the private sector. Uh, so greedy politicians are, are, are who you have to fear. And those guys are as greedy as anybody, if not greedier. Oh, I 100 percent agree. The average person doesn't understand that when someone comes to Congress, they immediately said they spend most of their time uh, campaign funding for reelection or they're negotiating side deals. I mean, the, the amount of look, look at all the disclosures that are coming about Nancy Pelosi and many other people in Congress, both political parties that are trading on inside information and they're making millions of dollars. Yeah, uh, look, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, they also like the power and the prestige and all the perks you know, that, that go along with, you know, being in Congress and having this huge staff and, you know, you know, you know, getting all kinds of respect. Because for, it's almost like a title. It's almost like they're a noble class at this point, which we're not supposed to have any nobility in the United States. But our our Congress, our senators are, are, are like lords and ladies and, you know, dukes and duchesses, you know, living off the people, right, not their own productivity. And they act like they're there, you know, to help us, but they're there to help themselves, you know, and, 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 you know, they have to, you know, BS a lot of people in order to get that support, but they're, you know, they're there to perpetuate their own lifestyle. And, and, and that's why we're in this mess. That's why the problems are so big because nobody wants to risk their own reelection to try to solve them. And that's how you get to government spending and now interest payments on the debt and all the other major line item expenses, unfunded liabilities, all this other stuff is, uh, depending upon how you measure it, 50 percent of GDP and it's headed even higher. Yeah. You know, and there's nothing we could do about it. Right. I mean, I mean, I've resigned myself to the fact, you know, I ran for Senate one time in 2010 talking about these issues, you know, and here we are, you know, 13 years later and the issues, you know, are haven't been addressed. The problems are bigger than ever. But the only thing we could do is try to invest as best we can to protect our wealth and, and profit from these events. You know, just like, you know, I profited from the demise of subprime because I understood that. Um, but I think the big money is going to be made in the inflation trade this time. I mean, I had the inflation trade on too. Uh, in 08, 09. And I lost on that end of it because I expected that uh, the result of the financial crisis would be a gold rally and a dollar decline. What happened was the dollar actually fell before the crisis. Gold rose before the crisis. So by the time the crisis hit, there was profit taking in gold. There was buying of the dollar. But where the markets are positioned now, gold is very cheap. The dollar is very high leading up to this coming into this crisis. And, and so this is going to be a surprise inflation crisis uh, that the, are going to caught, the markets are going to be caught off guard. And so all the inflation hedges are dramatically mispriced because everybody thinks there's no inflation to hedge because the Fed's going to get rid of it. But when they have to realize that the Fed's not getting rid of it because it can't, because it would crush the economy, and so it's going to back off, um, I think I'm going to make a ton of money. I think my clients are going to make a tremendous amount of money. Anybody following my advice will make a lot of money. How much we end up keeping is another story. I don't know what kind of windfall profit taxes they're going to be or what the government's going to do to punish the people who actually make money. They'll probably try to vilify the people who make money. You're the reason for this crisis. You bought all this gold. You sold dollars and you caused it, you know, as opposed to just positioning ahead of it because you, you, you know what's going to happen. So I would suggest that, you know, your listeners, I mean, get prepared. You know, if you don't own your gold or your silver, buy it before it really goes up. You know, shift gold is where you're going to get the best deal. That's my business, um, uh, shiftgold.com. Uh, if you got a stock portfolio, bond portfolio, you got to get out of Dodge. You got to get out of all the hyped up stocks that worked during the bubble as it was inflating. Get out of tech, social media, financials. You don't want to own 
bonds, you want to own inflation hedge stocks, value, dividend payer stocks, real dividends, natural resources, raw materials, industrial metals, precious metals, energy, agriculture, you know, things that people need to buy. Uh, you got to get into those real things now because the money, the paper is going to lose so much value. I've got mutual funds that are loaded up with the right kinds of stocks in the right countries. People can buy my funds, the Euro-Pacific funds at any discount brokerage house. You can go to my company, Euro-Pacific Euro Asset Management. We can manage your money. We can, you know, get you into my funds, get you into separately managed accounts. You know, the website is europac.com, E-U-R-O-P-A-C.com. You know, we can talk to the representatives, but, you know, Time is, is, I think, a factor here. I mean, I don't want to just sound like a, like a chicken little, but, you know, things, things are going to happen fast. I, I, it, it looks as bad to me as it's ever looked, you know, that we are on the cusp of, 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 of an overnight catastrophe. Um, maybe it's not going to be tonight. It could be, in which case it's too late to get prepared, but maybe it'll be next week, next month, maybe even sometime next year. But well, there was this there was a rumor happen. This is not something that's going to happen next decade. I mean, I mean, it could literally happen any day. I mean, that that's how bad it is. Yeah, I agree, Peter. There was actually a rumor going around Twitter a couple of weeks ago that the Federal Reserve Bank was calling every C, C, uh, excuse me, calling every single regional banker up and they wanted exact percentages of commercial real estate loan books. So it looks like the Fed is already preparing behind the scenes the next shadow liquidity or bailout program for some of that bad commercial real estate paper, maybe commercial real estate mortgage-backed securities or other stuff, trying to figure out how big the size of the bailouts are because they expect kind of a domino effect with treasury bond losses and small business loan losses, credit cards, auto loans, and then commercial real estate. Yeah, all of this. And, you know, these credit, I mean, they're all talking about how the loan, the losses are are not big right now. And 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 that's because people want to make the minimum payments on their credit card bills because they're living off their credit cards, but they're running up the the balances massively. And at some point, even the minimum payments are going to be too much. Uh, or they're going to run into their credit limit. Like once you get to your credit limit, once you're maxed out, well, then you might as well stop making your payments, right? If you can't borrow any more, then you know, people are going to stop paying. So there's a lot of pent up defaults that are out there uh, in credit cards. Uh, all these loans, I mean, auto loans. I mean, people forget for years, people were low, rolling negative equity into their auto loans. So let's say you, you came into an automobile uh, dealership and you had a car and you owed uh, 30,000 on the car, but the car was worth 20. The, the car dealership would say, no problem. We'll just roll that $10,000 into your new car. So they would buy a $60,000 car and they would borrow 70,000 and they drive it off the lot in a zero down mortgage, you know, car loan. So, I mean, the, 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 the auto companies were making more money financing the cars than, than producing and selling the cars. All these loans are going to blow up in a big way, just like they did in 08, only even bigger. Um, you know, these commercial mortgages that are going to be coming due, I mean, they're going into default. I mean, this this whole thing is going to end the only way it could end, with a wave of bankruptcies. And people want to say, oh, it's the Fed's fault for raising rates. No, it's their fault for lowering them in the first place. It's their fault for leaving them as low as they did for as long as they did. That was the problem. You know, it's like somebody jumps off the top of the Empire State Building and then, you know, they hit the pavement and they die. You see, oh, gee, the pavement was the problem. No, it was jumping from the top of the building. That was the problem. Hitting the pavement was the inevitable result of that. You know, so this was all of this was unavoidable once the Fed made the original mistakes. Yeah, it's the governments yeah. and the central banks, government spending and then bailouts, uh, corruption. And then the central banks were financing a lot of this stuff. The European Central Bank even had negative interest rates for years. That was oh, yeah. ridiculous, too. Uh, and and I used to make fun of the of, of Mario Draghi, you know, when he was doing his press conferences and he would say, yeah, we need to keep interest rates negative. We need to keep doing our asset purchase program because inflation is still below our target. And the target was close to but under two percent. And they were at inflation rates of like one point five, one point six, one point seven. I'm like, wait a minute. You're like 20 or 30 basis points below your target and you're you're doing all this. I'm like. <laughs> It's crazy. You're trying to fine tune the inflation rate to get it up to 1.99. 
And now it's, you know, 10 percent. I mean, I, it was asinine what they were doing and the fact that the academics and the media let them get away with it. The same thing here. Nobody criticized this policy and how completely asinine it was on either side of the pond. Other than guys like me or guys like you who they could say are they're just, you know, gloom and doom, uh, perma bears, you know, who cares what they say, right? Well, we've been talking about the cancel on effect. I mean, they created with the asset price inflation, the stock U.S. stock market added right before this this correction here, thirty three trillion dollars in market cap. I mean, a lot of that was asset price inflation with central bank balance sheet expansion globally and that capital coming here to the United States to our asset markets. Yeah, well, all the gains in the stock market were 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 you know valuations. The earnings didn't really grow, and the fact to the extent that the earnings did grow, it was because of financial engineering. They were able to you know buy you know borrow a lot of money cheap and buy back stock, and they were growing their earnings that way. But all of these loans are coming due, and now the companies have to refinance, and now they're looking at a whole new dynamic. Yeah, it's a total mess out there. We'll see how they decide to handle it. I mean, I would prefer free market forces and bankruptcy, but I don't think the people in power at the central banks and the governments are going to allow things like this. No, I mean, they think that they we, that we think that we tried that in ni- in the early 1930s under Hoover and we got and then, you know, everything got solved, you know, when we we brought FDR in. Uh, so they don't want to liquidate anything. They don't think that anybody should lose money. They think the government should step up and make sure that nobody loses money. But the only way they can do that is by making sure that everybody's money loses its value. So, again, there's no free lunch. You're either going to lose your money or you're going to lose your purchasing power. But you're going to lose something. And the government has proven time and time again all around the world they'd rather have your money lose its purchasing power than you lose your money. Because if you lose your money, you're going to blame the government. If you lose your purchasing power, the government's going to blame everybody else. Exactly. Well, Peter, I really enjoyed our discussion today. I want to thank you so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Keep up the good work. And again, people want to listen to my podcast, you know, listen to it on shiftradio.com. Go to my YouTube channel, uh, the Peter Schiff uh, uh, Shift Report. Subscribe. I got about 560,000 subscribers on YouTube. I've got almost a million followers now on Twitter. That's like my main platform where I kind of get the word out. So yeah, if you're not following me on Twitter, follow me and, and try to make sure your friends follow me too.